Ani, bojo. Kaji gaba we can dish nakas. Obishika keng and donjaba. Wabishki mayingen and dodem. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aladia Smoke. Uh, I'm from Latsol First Nation with family in Alderville First Nation. And I'm very pleased to be here this morning with uh, Matthew Hickey, Danny Roy, and Rebecca Baird um, to speak with you on uh, many voices in harmony, indigenous storytelling through architecture and the allied arts. And we have uh, such a beautiful set of presentations for you this morning, plus a chance to speak with all of your illustrious presenters. Um, this uh, comes to us at a really opportune time because uh, in Parliament right now, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, a bill uh, to implement that into federal law is currently in its second reading. And we suspect this is going to have some really exciting implications for architects. Um, in the wording and uh, the in the chat, you'll see a, a link to this uh, upcoming legislation, which we anticipate will pass its second reading. We think that this will have uh, uh, give architects more tools to implement Indigenous voices into our work, which is going to enrich the work. And we really are excited about this, uh, about this newly uh, um, uh, fleshed out approach to reconcilia reconciliation between uh, Canada and our Indigenous peoples. So as we listen to our presenters this morning, um, we hope that you're as excited as we are to learn about how um, we can more uh, effectively develop that free prior and informed consent uh, to decisions that affect uh, Indigenous territories, which is essentially all of Canada and all of North America in our work um, and how we can start to invite Indigenous peoples into a reciprocal decision-making process about architecture. Um, we expect that these changes will start to trickle down into provinces and perhaps into more public institutions. We've already been seeing a lot of RFPs with requirements for Indigenous content. And of course, architects are sort of left to their own devices as to how they define that in their proposals. Um, but we hope to develop new tools uh, the REIC Indigenous Task Force, for instance, uh, intends to develop some practice tips that we'll publish on how to invite Indigenous voices into the work. And um, I want to start to shift attention now to our, uh, our, in, our presenters this morning who are going to tell you uh, some wonderful stories, uh, share with you some of their exciting work. And um, I can't wait to see what they have to share with us this morning. Uh, first up, we have Matthew Hickey of Two Row Architecture. And um, Two Row Architect, I should say. And um, Matthew is um, uh, a good friend, I hope I can say. <laughs> we serve together on the RIC Indigenous Task Force and other initiatives. Um, and uh, he's a senior project architect and a Mohawk from uh, the Six Nations First, uh, Six Nations First Nation, and is a licensed architect with 16 years of experience working in an on-reserve architecture firm. He received his Master's of Architecture from the University of Calgary and his Bachelor of Design from Ontario Col College of Art and Design, winning both the Alberta Association of Architects President's Medal and the Medal for Best Thesis, respectively. Mr. Hickey's focus is on regenerative design, encompassing ecological, cultural, and economic principles. His research includes indigenous history and the adaptation of traditional sustainable technologies to the modern North American climate. Matthew currently sits on the board of directors for Toronto Artscape and is a member of the design review panel for Waterfront Toronto. He is he also currently instructs at OCADU and for the OAA. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning and Matthew I'll hand it over to you. Thank you lady and definitely we can call ourselves friends but thank you for that <laughs> thank you for that opening. Scano Sego Sagoli Songwenko Matthew Hikigiaso Hane is uh, I'd also like to thank the OEA for inviting me to this session and the other illustrious panel members. Looking forward to the conversations this morning. 
So I had the opportunity to write an article with the Bentway Conservancy, Conservancy for Azure Magazine in October of last year. In this article, I talked about the differences in Indigenous and Western ways of knowing and being, and our need to adjust our mindset about two things, time and our relationship with the world around us. So Western ways of thinking about time, or for that matter, a design and consultation process is very much linear. Typically, design starts at A, moving to B, and then on to C, with C not affecting B and B not affecting A. Indigenous ways of thinking about time are related to the natural cycles that occur around us, the cycles of the moon, the changing of the seasons, day and night, or even the cycle of life and death. We start at A, moving to B, and then on to C, always understanding that what we do now has an effect on what we call the future. Sometimes this is ref referred to as the seventh generation teaching, but specifically within indigenous, different indigenous cultures, this is an understanding that we are all connected to each other, to the natural world, to the cycles that surround us. So decolonizing the way we think about design and architecture the pro and the process by which we create the built environment begins with taking humans off the top of the pyramid and placing them as an equal part of the circle. In colonial ways of knowing and being, there is hierarchy. You're always trying to work your way to the top, but everyone and everything will eventually be below you. This can be related to humanity. We think as humans, we are better than everything else around us that we are special. In indigenous ways of knowing and being, we place ourselves as part of the circle. This is non-hierarchical thinking. We need, to, we need to understand that humans are no, no more important than a single drop of rain. If you really think about it, humans are just a blip in a massive timeline. Trees have been longer here than us. Water was here way before us. And both of these will likely live beyond the human blip. And if we really think about it, we are complete, completely connected through evolution, right back to bacteria. These ways of thinking inform how we approach our work. So we've been thinking a lot about how to make cities and urban developments better. Some people would argue that technology is key to solving urban issues, but we have been thinking about how to enact universal inclusivity to help fix our cities and create better ones for everyone and everything. So we pose the question, what would happen if all the power goes out? What makes a city great then? So we came up with these six F words and, and don't worry, they're, they're not explicit. <laughs> they're definitely capable of being broadcast. So for us, the six F words are food, flora and fauna, family, fun, and flexibility. So starting with food, Food is at the center of Indigenous cultures, yet one in eight households in Canada are food insecure. Amounting to over 4 million Canadians, including 1.15 million children, living in homes that struggle to put food on the table. This might be a result of the way that we are approaching how we grow food. Um, for example, monocrops, this requires a vast transport system to bring food to urban centres. It typically requires use of pesticides and fertilizers, which add to contaminated soil and eutrophication. So we have to ask, is this the smartest way to grow food? So creating landscapes that are fruitful and not just aesthetic could be a way to help solve some of these issues. But it's, but it's not only about growing food on site, it's also about how we grow food. For example, the Three Sisters of Corn, Beans, and Squash is an example of how Indigenous people have been growing food for thousands of years. The corn provides this, a stock for the beans to grow on, the beans provide nitrogen in the soil, and the squash keeps the soil uh, moist, each contributing in their own way to the success of all three. This technique is called a milpa and is prevalent in Mesoamerica. Plants and animals uh, are completely related to food as well and are also at the center of Indigenous culture. We can think about this as biodiversity, um, but we should be promoting places not just for people to live, but for animals, for insects, trees, plants, medicines, amphibians. They all need space as well. 
And not only does flora and fauna drive our ecosystems, but flora and fauna bring us enjoyment. Smart cities should account for diverse spaces and diverse species. This may be about migration, it might be about nocturnal animals, natural trails, breeding grounds, all these places of keeping for flora and fauna benefit humans as well. I mean, we often forget that other species hold the balance of power. We are no more important than a single bee because without them, we wouldn't be able to live. So our next step is family. This can also be referenced as community. Um, this pie chart is for potential tiny homeowners. This is a subject that we're not getting into, but the graph also shows a general breakdown of housing occupant types. Of note, singles, couples, and couples with children make up around 70% of the chart, with multi-generational mixed-use households being around 7%. So we feel we have lost our connection with family. There are some people who live still live in inter or multi-generational households, but the majority of us are raised to move out as soon as possible. This, is a, this has huge implications, especially in urban centers where rents and property are unaffordable for a lot of people. How we live and who we live with needs to create community, your selected family. This slide shows a cutaway of a cohabitation household. This typology is something that should be promoted in future developments. Um, Barcelona is also a great example of how we can think about living in community. Each one of these blocks provide everything that you need within walking distance, which allows people to get outside and to cross paths and to create community that goes beyond their household. The next step is fun. And fun for us refers to recreation, the ability to universally enjoy a place. So fun can be as, as simple as the ability to get outside and to be able to connect with nature in an active way. It's also about creating spaces for play, unorganized and organized play, and with this, informal learning. Infrastructure is also important for fun. It can support active living, such as running, biking, walking, swimming, skating, kayaking, whatever you need. But we need this infrastructure within our cities in order for us to be able to, to live in an exciting way. The last step I'm going to speak about is flexibility. And flexibility is the ability for our cities, urban realms, buildings, and ecosystems to adapt over time. And not just adapt, but easily adapt and freely adapt. There's nothing that irks me more when you see a bike lane go in in a city and then, you know, a week later they dig it up in order to put a new pipeline in. So being organized with how we place our infrastructure, using green space as infrastructure and promoting spaces for biodiversity can really help us how we bring forward our idea of flexibility within a city center. So uh, the, the, the word Turo, or the name of our firm, the Gaswenta, is something that also talks about universal inclusivity from a relationship point of view. So the Turo or the Gaswenta is a wampum belt that records an agreement between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. The two rows of beads represent a canoe and a Dutch ship traveling down the St. Lawrence River on parallel paths, each moving forward together and not interfering in each other's affairs. This is how we like to work at Two Row Architect, in collaboration, bringing together the strengths of both Western and Indigenous ways of knowing and being. And with that, I'll say thank you. Miigwech, Matthew. Um, thanks so much. Uh, so I'll ask if uh, there were any questions uh, from the audience, but um, and I can uh, pose them to Matthew. Uh, so if um, my first question, though, uh, to Matthew is that um, I loved when you were saying um, that humans aren't top of the pyramid, but they're part of the circle. And I liked how you uh, liken that to a drop of rain, which of course is so powerful. I mean, the circulation of water is what nurtures other life. And what I've heard from elders before is that our job is to go around and nurture life um, as humans. And that's actually our, our sort of superpower <laughs> is that we can go and do that. Um, it's similar to the power of water. So how do you see design as being able to do that, being like a drop of rain or being 
or nurturing other life? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's really about thinking about other things first before humans or thinking about them in parallel with other humans. And we talk about this as our relations. And we often think about flora and fauna as living things, but we also like to think about rain or the collection of rain or the wind or the sun as also our relations. And it's, if we start giving those ideas respect, we can start thinking about how do we include them in our conversations, the process by which we create you know, either urban realms, landscapes, architecture, design, anything can be incorporated uh, into that conversation uh, with our relations. It's really, for me, really prevalent here in Toronto, where we have a beautiful waterfront that we've neglected for so many years. We have things that we're doing right now, including the naturalization of the Don River, which is a huge mistake that we made, and now we're spending billions of dollars to correct it. And as you know, I mean, this place was sacred to our people. That was a very fruitful area, the Don Delta, where all of our clans lived. Um, very, uh, very uh, high productive area, lots of biodiversity. It was basically destroyed and now we're taking a step backwards to try and fix it. Um, we often do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of any of our meetings and we should be thinking about a water acknowledgement as well. You know, they're, they're so interconnected and yet we don't, we think of them as separate things, but they're really really amazing and where they meet is the most amazing part. So including and understanding these conversations in how you start thinking about design, who are we building for? What are we building for? What are we giving back? What are we keeping? All of these things I think are tied back into our relationship to the world around us. Thanks, Matthew. I find that really, uh, really inspiring. Um, so uh, at this point, I think what I might do is, um, unless there are any questions from the audience, um, uh, which I don't see any, <laughs> but feel free to pose some, we'll have a few more chances um, during the Q&A. Um, uh, I'll start introducing our next speaker. Um, I'm gonna be so inspired for the whole rest of the day now. <laughs> It's lucky we're doing this at the beginning because uh, if it were the, at the end, my energy level would already be down. I wouldn't be able to like enact all these things. But you know, since we're doing it at the beginning of the day, everyone can go out and do all these things for the whole rest of the day. <laughs> so this is really good. Um, so Danny, um, our next speaker uh, is uh, an intern architect with uh, Brooke McElroy. And Danny is, an, uh, in, is a planner also uh, and part of the Indigenous Design Studio. He's a member of English River, Dene Nation in Treaty 10 territory and uh, Cree Métis from the Northern community of Sakatuak, uh, Ila La Crosse in Saskatchewan. So he holds a Master of Architecture degree from the University of Calgary and a Bachelor of Arts honors degree from the University of Saskatchewan in regional and urban planning. Danny was formerly a senior regional, regional and community planner practicing in Saskatchewan and has had the opportunity to work with numerous municipalities and Indigenous communities to help develop sustainable planning frameworks. This included being co-authored and facilitator to the award-winning city of Prince Albert Municipal Cultural Action Plan and project lead to the Black Lake First Nation Community Land Use Plan. His high interest in community development, urban design, and architecture led him to enroll in the Master of Architecture program at University of Calgary and graduated in June 2020. During his studies, he researched and explored urban Indigenous design approaches, educational and community centre building typologies, and sustainable building practices. Danny joined the Indigenous Design Studio with Brooke McElroy and is leading and assisting in Indigenous placemaking projects within master planning and architectural projects. So Danny, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Good morning, Atlanta to Sisazi, Danny Roy, Sule. Hello, my name is Danny Roy. Uh, very honored to be speaking uh, with you all today and uh, very humbled to uh, be with uh, the, my fellow uh, panel members here. So lots to, to learn. And thank you, Eladia, for that wonderful introduction. Um, you've already introduced me. Um, 
uh, Cree Métis from Sacatawak and Jenny from English, English River First Nation. So uh, Sacatawak has a very rich and deep history when it comes to being a historical Métis community, uh, but also before that being a border space between the Cree and the Dene. So I'm a, a mixture of that history. Um, I'm quite new to the profession of architecture, um, as uh, Aladia had introduced in, uh, graduated in June 2020. Um, and started working with the Indigenous Design Studio uh, this past summer, so uh, lots, lots to learn. But prior to that, I was also a community planner uh, for a number of years in Saskatchewan. And I'd just like to introduce um, my introduction and my journey into architecture, because I think that frames um, this, this aspect of storytelling and my approach to uh, design thinking and working in Indigenous architecture. So. I'd like to consider my journey into architecture in a sort of a roundabout way. Um, always been interested in, in architecture. Um, interestingly enough, the school um, I went to growing up was designed by Douglas Cardinal. So of course I didn't know that then, but perhaps that was a, a foreshadow into my interest in, in pursuing indigenous architecture. But my undergrad education brought me to the regional and urban planning program at the University of Saskatchewan. And I, understood that as being a step in, stepping stone into the, the field of architecture. But through, through my studies and through my professional work, I really began to appreciate and value what community planning had taught me. Um, it, it helped me better understand the context of place, the context of uh, relationships to land, and the power of voice. And I think this really helped me uh, laid the foundations for my design thinking as I transitioned into this um, field of architecture. So uh, for a number of years, I was uh, a planner in Saskatchewan, and I was able to see a lot of places um, work and, and visit that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to visit otherwise. So from the northern edges of Stony Rapids to the grassy plain land, plains of uh, Maple Creek. So and all the spaces in between. So it really, it really gave me a sense of, of connection to land. And through community engagement and being in these local communities, understanding their own histories, their own context, and allowing those to be heard in these planning processes, it allowed me again to get, gain this different perspective of relationships to one another and how I'm carrying this forward in the work that I'm doing currently. So as a member of the Indigenous Design Studio with Brooke McElroy, um, as the introduction stated, so I'm leading, in, in leading and assisting in various placemaking and placekeeping efforts, not only in architectural project, but urban design and also landscape architecture. So the projects that we pursue are from a co-design and co-planning collaborative with the Indigenous communities we work with. So we, we go off the model of nothing for us without, without us. And it's this idea that when we work with the Indigenous communities, it's very important that we include the voices of these, of these communities into the designs or planning that we do. And it's, it's, it's really involving them from the very beginning and carrying them through the whole process. And that's one of the things that we, we carry forward. <clears throat> So when it comes to storytelling and weaving into these architectural projects, of course, there's many different um, placekeeping and placemaking frameworks, some of which are specific to Indigenous communities and Indigenous processes themselves. But one way that I like to approach, or one way that I, I find that I've been doing the work with in the Indigenous Design Studio, is through the patient process of listening. Hearing the stories of our elders, or the knowledge keepers and community members, this is integral to the design process. And it's taking the time um, to learn and research the, the communities that we're with, understanding that each community is different, each of them have different needs and wants, and how, and from there, how do we translate and, and ideate what, what we've heard and learned from the communities into a tangible object or tangible space into the built environment. So uh, again, this is an iterative process, and through our various projects, uh, we'd like to be as iterative and comprehensive as possible, of course, recognizing some timelines and, and budget. Um, but through that, we, we weave different concepts and narratives and themes into, into the work that we do through placekeeping, um, placemaking efforts, of course, having the community involved from the very beginning. So I just have to spend some time um, with uh, focusing some projects that deploy this idea of, of working with community and this idea of st storytelling uh, through various aspects, starting with restoring presence. So this is the George Street Public Realm Revitalization Project here in Toronto. 
um, and this project has been um, um, ongoing and it, it involved the what we call the Indigenous Caucus from, from the very beginning. Um, and just to note, um, some of these projects I wasn't personally involved in, but just want to showcase the, the process that IDS or the Indigenous Dis Design Studio um, does. So it's the idea of restoring Indigenous presence within the urban fabric. And when we think about urban spaces, these are spaces that have historically excluded Indigenous voices and representations through, through decades, through the century. And it's really about restoring a uh, presence of a pride for, for Indigenous people to, to come to the street and see, and see the, the culture come alive in a tangible sense, but also as an educational component for non-Indigenous people to, to learn more about um, the culture. So one specific element of this, of this streetscape are cultural markers and we embed cultural markers um, in a number of our projects and each of them have their own form and own narrative to tell. <clears throat> but in this particular case, it's, it's the teachings of the Ishinabe seven stages of life um, across the medicine wheel. So starting with the good life, um, the small diagram in the top left there and moving clockwise to giving back. And it's this idea of, of telling stories along these cultural markers that will be spread across the site. So seven sites that denote these uh, various markers. And it's looking at different patterning. So some of the patterning that we deployed is uh, the juniper for its uh, restorative uh, elements in, in soil. So it's this idea of restoration for, for George Street. And um, it's again, an opportunity for um, non-Indigenous people to, to learn certain aspects um, of this narrative. Moving forth to another project, so telling uh, spaces for storytelling. So this is the Awen Indigenous Gathering Place in Collingwood. So it was built in the spirit of reconciliation for non-Indigenous and indi Indigenous people to come together, to share stories, to learn from one another. And it was designed by members of the IDS and guided by the knowledge and advisor uh, Dr. Duke Redbird. So it's the idea of the sculptural representation of a food forest linking each forest layer to the seven ancestor teachings. And it, it's, it's placing importance again on language as well. So having traditional Anishinaabe languages of the, of the good way of life embedded into these objects to really bring presence and um, um, to, to, to the culture. So people could be, could be um, proud to be here. So the, the poles are Alaskan cedar poles tilted at varying angles in a circle that holds structural, uh, sorry, uh, steel canopies that have a pattern of the various food elements, trad traditional foods, along with the traditional garden that surrounds the, the gathering space. So it's meant to evoke the visual attribute of forest trees. Looking at another project here, so storytelling within communities. So this is the Saugeen First Nation Amphitheater and Gardens. So this is a community that is really at the forefront of their economic development through cultural placemaking. Um, the site has a historical um, uh, amphitheater that was built in the 70s as an act of reconciliation between the chief and the United Church Minister. So the community have, uh, the community members have a unique skill in, in dry stone walling and they provide certification to community members and to the public. So they, um, so the IDS had taken this um, in mind when designing the landscape, but also the uh, visitor center that'll, that'll house ceremonies, concerts, theaters, weddings, guest speakers, but taking advantage of the, the skill set that the community members have uh, in the dry stone walling, so becoming part of the, the building itself. And of course, this was going, went through a co-planning and co-design process. There was a feast at the beginning of the process to introduce the project, to start, to start the project in a good way. And of course, food brings a lot of people together and it's a really great way to, to break the bread, bread per se, and um, a way for, for us as designers to really um, um, engage and have uh, discussions that are fruitful and how we're able to translate that into a project like this. I just want to end off on another project here. Um, it doesn't always have to be a built project. It could be storytelling through graphic language. So this is an interior space that we're doing for a future Indigenous initiative suite um, at a post-secondary institution. So it's an interior job and it, we're 
finding ways to create a graphic language that tells a narrative between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. So finding common ground, uh, connection to land, connection to water. Of course, the Eastern White Pine has a uh, great significance as a tree of peace, uh, along with the Grand River. So we're finding elements of, of these, these natural elements finding ways to to tell a story through through graphic language and one way is looking at the the tree piece the ridges of the bark um, they're almost reminiscent of water waves so um, finding ways to, to look at that or looking at the five needle five needle leaf ways of abstracting that pattern so this is just the way that we represent on a graphic language here um, so representing the traditional clans of the Haudenosaunee and the Ishnabe. So there's some overlap of the traditional clans. Um, the idea of the five needle leaf um, on the top and bottom of the river system. So it's just one of the ways that we're, we're thinking about incorporating stories um, in the work that we do. So just some closing thoughts. Um, you know, uh, as a relatively new um, um, in the field of architecture, uh, I don't want to I think I'm wearing too much of a rose tinted glasses here, but I think there are there's great potential in in indigenous architecture and place making uh, making an impact in cities and communities. If we think about sustainable building practices, there's lots to learn from uh, traditional indigenous uh, ways of knowing, ways of being, and how do we embed that into the the work that we do. Uh, from the, my previous work, being a planner, uh, allowing those to be heard in process, and so going through this iterative co-design and co-planning process. And every community has their own story, so what are ways that we as designers can help unfold these designs into thoughtful and mindful ways? Thank you. Miigwech, Danny. Uh, some beautiful spaces you shared. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so um, <clears throat> one of the things you said at the beginning of your presentation um, uh, struck me, but I'm not sure if I heard it again. So I think it might be an interesting point. Um, uh, you said that um, you had a, a roundabout way of thinking about space. And am I getting that right? Um, more so. More about that? Yeah, it was more so like my roundabout journey into architecture. I've always been interested in, in the design spaces, but um, I'm similar to a lot of people that are in the architecture field. It's not uh, an A to B journey from, from being a, an architect. So uh, the way I described it is um, being interested in architecture, but going through planning. I'm going through the journey of being a community planner and understanding the importance of community engagement, being in, in local communities, and how that influenced my, my thinking now as I'm in, in this field of architecture. Yeah, and you came to architecture through uh, the discipline of planning. So that's probably giving you a really interesting sort of lar larger scale uh, view of spaces and the effects yeah. that design have mm -hmm. on uh, how we move through space and how we use space. Um, then, then you also said that um, that uh, two elements you thought were important were storytelling through the use of space and integrating uh, indigenous perspectives on space. So I know through my work, whenever I work with indigenous people, I learn something really amazing. Uh, that I carry with me <laughs> to all future projects, and it really sticks with me. So is there anything you'd like to share that, that's really stuck with you, uh, storytelling or perspectives on space that you've heard from people you've worked with? Um, and similar to what you said, I'm always learning. I'm from the bush of northern Saskatchewan, so coming to, to Takaranto and, and learning about all the, um, the, the treaty narratives and the history. So um, I'm always amazed. I'm always learning something new, especially um, less than a year in, in living in, in Toronto. So it's always interesting to come across um, um, stories or, or ways of, of knowing um, through, through the lens of architecture and how we embed, that, embed it into the work that we do. Right. Are there any specific things that really stand out to you? I, I know that, uh, you know, the, the work with Sagin and the dry stone walling is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, any, any other like specific uh, memories you have of things people have told you that you, you just think are so crucial to the work? 
Yeah, um, another work that we're doing with the post-secondary um, is we did a, um, an elders gathering, which was virtual. So of course, that's another challenge um, being new and starting in a virtual sense is how do we engage with, with people in a virtual setting? So uh, through this elders gathering, um, one of the key components of, of um, the university is they're forced. And one of the elders had told us, uh, food is pharmacy. We get, or forest is pharmacy we get a lot of our, our medicines from the forest. So we wanna ensure that we want to protect um, the land when we're developing on, on the university. But also how do we, how do we um, teach others, post-secondary students, the importance of traditional medicines, but also at the same time protecting our knowledge. Um, so there was that back and forth of how, and us as designers, how do we, how do we mitigate between these two worlds, um, protection, but also teaching others. So I think forest is, forest best pharmacy was really one of the things that struck out to me that was really neat. Yeah, yeah, and that idea, I think that, uh, I guess what I'm hearing in your work is that there doesn't have to be necessarily dichotomy between spaces meant for humans and spaces meant for everything that isn't human. <laughs> mm, exactly. That, that we actually are trying to bring those things together through that process that you called weaving. So <laughs> yeah, that's an inspiring idea, I think. And it really empowers designers to really think more deeply about uh, what kinds of life we're inviting into our spaces. Um, so uh, thanks so much, Danny. Um, I'm going to switch now to uh, Rebecca, and I really can't wait to see what Rebecca has to share with us because I've uh, heard about your work, and of course, uh, it's you know your whole story is really inspiring, Rebecca. So um, Rebecca is a Nehiao Cree Métis artist, and as uh, a senior artist, Rebecca. Uh, appreciates the important occasions that art offers to connect and engage with the broader public. Her personal artistic approach has focused upon issues of authenticity, rearticulating, revisioning, and reclaiming Indigenous narratives through visual media processes that inspire contemplation and conversation. Uh, Baird was at the forefront of early recognition of Indigenous cultural contributions. Benchmark exhibitions include From Sea to Shining Sea, 1987, The Power Plant, Toronto, which presented her mixed media piece In the Center Lies the Sky, Indigena, 1992, Museum of Civilization, Hull, Quebec, featured Heartland, created in co collaboration with artist Kenny Baird. The visual arts exhibitions uh, she has presented over the course of her career have been well recognized with works collected by such preeminent institutions as the Royal Ontario Museum, the former Museum of Civilization, Winnipeg Art Gallery, and Thunder Bay Art Gallery. Additional presentations have been exhibited Canada-wide as well as abroad. An interest in public artwork began with the Great Mystery commissioned by Queen West Community Health Centre, Toronto, 1996. Open Sky, 2001, Lester B. Pearson Airport followed commissioned by Greater Toronto Airport Authority. Her most recent public artworks include All My Relations, CMA, CAMH Toronto, 2018 and Star Blanket, the King Liberty Bridge Project Toronto, 2019. True to Baird's artistic oeuvre, these public art pieces serve as aesthetic landmarks while enhancing the public's appreciation of Indigenous culture and promoting a shared sense of community continually in the making. So Rebecca, please take it away. Well, I'm so pleased to be here and with Matthew and you and Danny. Um, yeah, I, I'm, uh, my family is from Treaty 6 territory. My, uh, my Indigenous ancestors and my non-Indigenous ancestors are in Northern Ontario. Uh, I still have family in both places, uh, particularly Kirkland Lake, Ontario. That's where my... So um, I guess we can start. Um, I don't... Uh, maybe Patrick can... It's there? Yeah. Can it be a little bigger, Patrick, or... Does anybody see that? Can you all see that? Or is that? 
I think our preview might be a thumbnail preview. You can change it with your view button, but uh, everyone else can see it just fine, I think. Okay, so this is um, this is the Queen West Health Center. I was living, it was a really lovely project to work on. It's a mural, uh, like painting nine feet by 54 feet. And uh, it, was the, um, it was the actual doctors and the staff who really uh, fought for getting some artwork at that time. They were, uh, there was, uh, the government at the time, and this is 1996, was uh, not going to support art, but they fought really hard to get this artwork. Also, right at the, it's at Richmond and Bathurst, just south of, um, south of Queen. So yeah, Bathurst and Queen. And, um, and right there is the meeting place where a lot of Native people, uh, uh, you know, that's a place where they can go to have food, clothing, uh, get, uh, you know, talk to an elder. So they also, the doctors really wanted and the staff that something was Indigenous. So I painted it, it airbrushed because we only had a month to do it before the um, place opened. So I worked with William Laszlo and you'll see I worked with, I worked with a whole team of people like uh, glass makers and Anyway, so um, yeah, they airbrushed it. And then you, we can go to the next one so you can see maybe the next slide. So there you can see I, uh, it's all, there's the birch bark because of the birch bark scrolls, but also the, there's the sky. I have, think of the birds and they're the seed carriers. They travel, you know, migrate. Uh, and then I, uh, there's the berries. You can see the medicine by the uh, raven. There's, the, you can see um, the sage. By the blueberries, you can see the sweet grass. Uh, then you can see um, the cedar. And then also I put around that time, that's an image of uh, Elijah Harper when holding up the single eagle feather in, in the Manitoba parliament to bring down the Meech Lake Ford. And then the last image, I think of the basket makers or the, all the makers. And if you know how to make a basket, then you know the stories, you know the medicines. Like if you're a sweet grass basket maker, you know how to pick the medicine, honor the medicine. And it's still there. It's it's on the second floor of the uh, facility. And so the next piece, this next slide, please. This is open sky, um, and that was at the the airport, Lester B. Pearson Terminal Two. I didn't. There was a. I didn't get a major comp, uh, one of the commissions, but they uh, commissioned me to do a nine by fifteen foot painting and it's in the jazz airline so I was thinking of all the communities that when they're flying home if they have to come down to Toronto maybe for medics medical uh, you know um, or medicine or and then when they're flying back home so there's the eagle and there's the again the stars and then I thought I was up in Bearskin Lake maybe 15 years ago and the sunsets were so incredible the kids laughed at me because I was always out taking pictures but so I I made it very graphic but these beautiful sunsets and uh, yeah, and then I was at, it was lovely. I was I actually met um, Moshi Sadfi because I believe he did something there. So it was I, I, they had a lovely gala, and I ended up sitting at the table and having a wonderful conversation with him. Oh, and I forgot to mention with the um, the great mystery, it was Jerome Markson who was the architect, and he uh, he was lovely uh, to work with, and he wrote me a great reference letter that I continue to use when I'm applying for projects. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the drawings for, this is King and Liberty, uh, the, the village, and then uh, they have a, they made a pedestrian bridge to uh, go across, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, GO train. And uh, so that I, a lot of my work is about interconnectedness and storytelling and placekeeping. So the uh, star blanket is a Cree, but also Lakota, Dakota, and it's been, um, taken in by many cultures now. And the star blanket is very special. Uh, it's like a circle in the center and then all these uh, concentric diamonds. So it's all about community and interconnectedness and always a community in the making. And that's what I was thinking about at King and Liberty. And so we can get to the next slide, please. So there's uh, images of it. Uh, there's a south uh, tower or pier and a north and the south, uh, one of them is like the daylight, and then the uh, the uh, the darker one is for the evening. And then I extended all the lines, <clears throat> excuse me, to make them think of like intersections and pathways. And uh, there was uh, this is there was 106 windows, and this is the design is embedded in the glass, and it's open now. The elevators aren't, but it's open now, and you can walk across. 
And the star blanket is a lovely story. Uh, what happens if when you're born, you're wrapped in a star blanket. Uh, when you graduate, you're wrapped in a star blanket. When you get married, you're you and your partner are wrapped in a star blanket. And when you go home, you're wrapped in a star blanket. So it's a really prominent image. And so I feel that I um, just gave uh, Toronto two star blankets. And we can, I guess we can see the next slide. So this is CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And I really do like working with health uh, facilities. And um, they had staff uh, and also uh, patients that uh, voted on the artwork. And um, so I did, again, in a large mural, worked with William Laszlo. It's, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, 15 feet high by 45 feet. And uh, I was also thinking, it's called All My Relations. I wanted something to be really exuberant and look, you know, welcoming. Uh, but also I was thinking of mid-century modern design. I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and I just remember those vibrant patterns on curtains and pillows. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so, um, so there it is. This is the early drawings. And so I took those satellites that you know are very prominent in mid-century modern design, and I want to pull it into the room so it was like an installation, not just a flat wall. And I worked with Alfred Enger, who's a very famous glass artist. He pan blue the orbs and uh, then I worked with Eventscape who are fabricators and they did the metal or steel and aluminum armatures to put the satellites and there's seven different satellites so it's, again seven stages of life the seven grandmother grandfather teachings the idea that in the centers the elders and then outward the parents and the children and I don't know if we have and then I can show you an actually the next picture which is, that's it, <clears throat> that's it installed on the second floor. So this is where if, uh, you know, someone was feeling anxious or maybe depressed and needed to talk to someone, this is where they would enter. And like I just mentioned earlier, I wanted it to just feel like, oh, this is a safe place. I'm going to be okay here. And also for maybe family uh, visiting, you know, someone who might be in care and also for the staff uh, coming to work every day. But it also became a uh, like a place, a wayfinding. It could be like, you know, meet me at the mural or meet me under the satellites. So I think I probably, that's pretty quick, but uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rebecca. That was uh, so exciting. Um, so um, I'm just uh, really, uh, well, I'm going to say blown away because you said glassmakers, and that made me think of Netflix, the blown away that was filmed right here in Hamilton where I'm at. So. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm blown away by what you've shared. <laughs> and uh, I was also excited to see that you that you used uh, glass in your in your uh, pieces and that they were so architecturally integrated, you know, like they actually modify your perception of space. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering about your star blanket project. Um, I, I'm a little bit self-serving here because I'm working on a library and we're mm -hmm. using star blanket motif for all the good community work. So I wonder if you can share a little bit more about star blanket and how that starts to uh, modify the space or anything you can share about that particular concept. Because I'm yeah. interested in it from a self-serving <laughs> perspective. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I just, I, I, I have a photo which I, just got because someone went to take some pictures. So when you do walk up the stairs, the star blanket is gonna be right on an angle. So it's going to feel like you're, you know, it's wrapped around you and it's quite large. But I think the most thing about um, the star blanket is it's just, it's so phenomenal in terms of uh, in interconnectedness and how everything is, you know, uh, I, I keep on saying interconnectedness, but yeah. And that, and it's also bright, you know, you can, change all kinds of colors. Uh, I've done, I've actually put in for a couple commissions to actually do a star blanket as a huge sculpture, which will be about maybe 15 feet high, I think, and, and quite thick. And it's gonna be coming out a bit, so it looks like it's transforming. But I think that's what I like about the star blanket. It's just about, it's not about that comfort, connectedness. And, um, and I've actually made a few couples. I made a star blanket for my niece's little girl. So that was, I learned how to make a star blanket this year. 
Yeah. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I've never made one. I'm I might actually put it on a building before I do it in, <laughs> in real life. <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to do that. <laughs> Um, so I'm also, I loved your um, piece in, uh, the, it's the Center for uh, Addictions and Mental Health, right? C-A-H, yeah. yeah. Mm. And that is such a beautiful place to have a piece like uh, like what you have there. Um, and I'm just trying to find the name of it again, uh, All My Relations. Yeah, so I had heard that the Anishinaabemowin word for that was Nadinawe uh, Maganaduk. Mm -hmm. So all my relations, that's what I had heard. And that's such a powerful concept in, um, uh, at least from an Anishinaabe, an Anishinaabe perspective, um, Nadinawe Maganadag sort of like informs all of how we move through the world. And the, the, the piece seems to have almost like pieces of like, pieces of pollen or pollination coming coming off of it. Uh, and, mm. and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the the power of the piece and how it affects your 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 perception of space in that in that area there in that atrium. Thank you. Yeah, and there's also I didn't point out that there was actually there's orbs in the um, the 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 um, large mural and that was like because our ancestors are here all the time. And uh, so that's, and then also I commend that Cam H uh, hired my late brother-in-law, uh, Elder Vern Harper. And so he was there for many years and he, uh, you know, treated both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. He was so successful. And so at, at, on one part, you'll see at the end on the right, I have a spider web to recognize him because his spirit helper was a spider. But I just like, we did the, the mural first and then uh, I just thought, no, we have to bring it out. We have to bring that mural out and then that's when I chose the satellite and originally we went we, you know because you can buy those uh, satellite um, what do you call them lights but they just look too much like lights like because that, that's you know um, and it was just sort of budget concerns and things like that but I thought no they just look like lights and then at one point they did want maybe those satellites to be lit and then it was so much to go through the CAA and you know all, or uh, forget what it, anyway so we that's when we went we decided to just make them out of glass and uh, have, and Alfred hand blew them all and, um, and they're all different colors. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Oh I, yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful piece. I just want you to talk more about it. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lovely, lovely piece. Um, is there anything that you'd like to convey to architects about the integration or the interaction of art and architecture anything that's come that comes to your mind about why art is important to space or how those two disciplines interact no definitely and uh, i've worked always closely with the architects uh and i'm currently right now i'm uh, an indigenous art consultant for the new Etobicoke Civic Center, and there's going to be a, a major, four major, uh, or at least three for just Indigenous artists. But uh, it's always important to talk to the architect, but mostly uh, for myself, it's the community. And so all those projects, it's what the community really wanted. And, um, and I think sometimes it happens with, uh, it can happen with architects that, um, because their places are pretty spectacular, the work I saw both of, you know, Matthew and Danny, some, they don't want, somehow the artwork has to just complement the, the architecture. So uh, it's not like a, something just being plunked down, which is that whole idea of all everything being related and all works together, tells those stories. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. That was uh, really inspiring, especially on, uh, uh, what day is it even today? Does it matter? <laughs> it's a Tuesday, it's a Tuesday morning. <laughs> I don't think it matters anymore. <laughs> One day, perhaps it will again. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I want to bring uh, Matthew and Danny back into the conversation. I mean, uh, some of the concepts shared this morning have been uh, so amazing. Um, you know that humans are part of the circle and we're just as powerful, but also just as inconsequential as a single drop of rain. Uh, and that uh, we have to adopt our our position of of 
you know, invigorating the life around us, just like, just like that rain does. And then Danny's perspectives of, you know, a roundabout approach to architecture that might take a larger view and then, and then zoom in on specific storytelling elements that we share through space. Um, and figuring out the strengths in individual communities, like using that Saugeen community's uh, skill in dry stone walling in our architecture, searching out where those strengths lie and then letting them speak through the space. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, of course, Rebecca's perspectives that we just talked about where, um, you know, the concept of all my relations and the concept of supporting each other and art supporting architecture, almost enveloping us in, uh, in a more inspiring sense of space that has a deep meaning. Um, you know, I, when I, I'm just getting back to your, oh man, that piece is so beautiful. The all my relations piece and, and the rest of them too. Um, I'll have to take a closer look and go visit your star blanket because, uh, because that one, um, you know, I, I hope to do something just as good someday. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, those are really, really beautiful stories. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to open it up now to, um, to questions from the audience. So we're going to uh, invite um, some live back and forth with our, uh, with our panelists here. Um, so first question we received was from Valerie Dawn. Um, how can we foster collaborative community involvement in COVID times with communities that have limited or unreliable internet access, especially elders? Oh, that's a tough one. So I'm going to toss that over first off, uh, maybe to Matthew, but then everyone can chime in. Sure. Thanks, Lady. And thank you for the question. I mean, this is a, this is a reality that we've been in for what a uh, year and a bit now, a year, almost 14 months uh, since March 13th. Um, Kiro, when we first started the pandemic last year, won a big job on the West Coast, which was kind of a kind of a neat thing in the sense where being not allowed to go there almost made it a little bit easier for us in the sense where we could start communicating through online platforms. I think there's a few things that are key to making sure that this works, especially with elders. And number one is patience. <laughs> You're going to have to add in an extra 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of the conversations for everyone to turn their mic off, to get signed on, but also to speak to each other. A lot of these elders haven't seen each other, you know, in, in, since the pandemic started as well, and they were used to gathering in their own right. So allowing them to say hello to each other and uh, and ask questions <laughs> and laugh a little bit is really sort of, sort of a fantastic uh, way to start this off. So adding in that extra time to the beginning of the meetings, um, I mean the internet is a is a really difficult thing to figure out, um, especially in the north. I think we're moving in a direction where it's almost becoming a right. Um, but yeah, this, for me, it's really about patience and about spending or allowing more time at the beginning and even at the end of meetings to, to have those informal conversations and, um, to let them, let them sign on. Yeah. Uh, any, any thoughts from, uh, Rebecca or Danny, how we might connect with us, particularly elders who might have a little bit of, uh, more hurdles with technology and with those communities that don't have reliable internet access. Yeah, and I, I think Matthew uh, really hit it on the head there and having patience and, you know, it's really trial and error, really, you know, we're, you know, 16, 18 months into this pandemic and we're trying, you know, different options of, of engaging and uh, we tried virtual platforms and some of them are successful. Some of them, you know, we, we wish we, we found other ways and, and sometimes we find just the simple act of picking up the phone, um, contacting the band administrator, um, seeing if there's ways to distribute a survey through paper form um, and collection, and collecting them and, and finding ways to bring, you know, uh, information back to us. So um, it's, yeah, like I, like I said, it's, it's trial and error. Um, some, some instances work for other communities and then some others, you, you try to have to think outside the box. Yeah, I agree with Danny. Uh, I think it 
picking up a telephone can do a lot, especially when we were looking for artists. It was when I called them, you know, for the Atopics so and that made the difference because then they could ask more questions and have more concerns than just getting this RQ, RFQ, you know, which can seem very, and pages and pages. Uh, so I think, yeah, I would say a telephone, going back to old technology could work <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, the, you know, if the internet isn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for those ideas. Um, uh, another question, um, uh, I've, uh, again, from Valerie Dawn, um, that uh, uh, she's heard that learning a meal can be important to show gratitude and respect uh, when co-designing with an Indigenous community. So how can we replace this gesture when we have to engage virtually? Yeah. Any ideas? Has, have any of your clients figured out ways of, around this? I haven't um, not been in the process that we've had so far, but I've heard stories of um, catering, um, using you know, Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes to, to send food to maybe the speaker or, or the elders. So, you know, again, finding finding interesting ways to, to give back and, and to be grateful for, for the knowledge they're giving. Yeah, yeah, we've had on when uh, the project that we're working on the West Coast is uh, University of Victoria's National Center for Indigenous Laws, and we've been working with a fair number of elders out there. and And on the West Coast, they have a process called witnessing, um, which is very connected to their laws as well. Um, and we've been lucky enough to kind of have a liaison who's actually there and can go and visit the elders. So they would go and take them, whether it's food or, or payment or part of that witnessing for the gifts that were given. So it's almost like you need someone on site that can do that work for you in a um, community, uh, aspect or is related to the community. I mean, this, this becomes even more difficult when there's a pandemic. <laughs> and I think these are very unusual situations, but I think that Indigenous people are industrious and innovative and they always find a way to work through these processes of ceremony. Um, and that's that's one of the ways that we did. We had, we had someone that was on site or in that area that was uh, able to go visit these elders. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, one community I worked with, uh, uh, the uh, the client was really, really great. And she, um, along with some of her staff, uh, hosted an event in uh, one of their public spaces. I think it was a community center because the whole community was uh, locked down. Anyhow, they felt safe enough to do that. So they had the elders come gather and they served food and there was a big raucous conversation. I, I was sort of in the background asking some questions, but it was really about the elders getting together. <laughs> and I think we, we captured some of the conversation, but yeah, we were definitely just a sideshow <laughs> in a much different circus because <laughs> they hadn't seen each other for months. So it was, a, it was an exciting event. <laughs> um, so again, Valerie Dawn, can someone expand on place making versus place keeping? I don't know if there's any thoughts on that. Um, I think I've heard from uh, like, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I should moderate. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca, I'll let you go ahead first. <laughs> uh, I've heard from like Val King, you know, the elder from uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and she likes pay place keeping because it's already here and we're just keep, keep taking, you know, keep, keep taking care of it. So that's where I, you know, and so it's different, like, than place making is it's still making a mark, but I think place keeping is going right back to the original, to the land and what it was like. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Matt, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, place making sounds like us as humans are making this thing appear. In reality, we're trying to keep place that's already here for our relations. And there's some um, writing that has been done by this by Juana de la Costa. And there's a book that she produced that you can take a look at for further reference. But um, it's I, it's just a mindset shift. And that's one of the things that we're trying to to do is to think about us in relation to the land as opposed to us dominating the land. So to me, it's about placekeeping. And it's interesting to think about that within an urban setting. You know, how do we place keep within, within uh, an urban setting that's already been adapted for, for the city? So 
um, thinking about ways of bringing back, of course, it's, it's kind of ironic to bring back um, traditional uh, landscaping to a street. Um, but it, it's, it's, yeah, like you said, it's a different way of thinking. How do we, how do we keep a place uh, rather than making one? So it's a mindset. <clears throat> Yeah, and as I said earlier, it's kind of funny that we're already doing that, especially like with the Don, you know, we're, we're straightening the Don River out for flood purposes, but also it's because we can, we screwed it up, you know, it's like, how do we give things back to not only nature, um, but also to us when we do these actions, um, the return areas to naturalization that allow for our relations to live, allow for the water to flow properly. It gives us life too, so it's a it's really um, it's really a win win situation when we start thinking about it in that way. But you're absolutely right. We have to almost give back. It's almost place giving back in in an urban realm. So maybe it's place giving. <laughs> oh, it's a new new term. <laughs> we've 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 uh, revolutionized it already. Uh, okay, so from uh, Jason Mueller, this is a tremendously important question. Uh, what advice can you give to our present? Uh, can our pre presenters give? Uh, to those of us who want to acknowledge and engage with our Indigenous communities that don't really know where to start. <laughs> so uh, maybe I'll uh, uh, bunt this over to Matthew first. This, this is a really big question. And I mean, the first thing to remember is that you encompassing Indigenous, the word Indigenous is kind of a pan word. And community is also in that regard. And one of the things you need to really do is get to know the people that you're working with and very specifically their culture. We tend to just kind of group everyone into one kind of pot and that's not the way it works. Um, we like to call this relationship building as opposed to consultation. And for us, that's about spending time with people and having the patience to do that. A lot of our the ways that we build and the way that we tender buildings these days is so backwards from an indigenous point of view, especially when you're looking at like a P3 process where you don't even get to speak to people until the building's already been designed. So for yeah. us, it's about taking that time at the beginning, right? And making sure that you have uh, enough time and respect to be able to build a relationship with the specific indigenous community that you're working with. The moment you do that, I mean, the moment is the moment you're going to have, they're going to have more respect for you and more trust for you. And you're also going to learn way more at the beginning, which will allow, allow you to guide your design and your process further. So that's what I would say, giving some time to create a relationship with a specific community. Yeah, and taking the time to, to have that chat, have that, that, that conversation. Um, it could be in person, it could be, again, picking up the phone. Um, trying to establish that relationship from the very beginning and one of the i'm speaking from the planning side of things one of the challenges in working with indigenous communities is oh another study we're doing so sometimes there's a bit of, of, of um, apathy when when indigenous people um, they don't want to be studied some more essentially so when it comes to working on a new project it's it's relationship building as matthew was saying from the get-go you know starting off in a good way talking with with you know elders and and, and knowledge keepers and, and getting off on the right foot food was a is a good way to to start things off but of course challenges with the pandemic right now kind of makes it difficult so again thinking thinking outside the box well i agree with both what matthew and danny is saying that it's about relationships and even with the etobicoke civic center often when you are applying for public art uh, you know, there's the request for qualifications and then you put in your CV and, you know, your past work and then you get shortlisted and then you have to come up with an idea and you might be a finalist. But here with the Etobicoke Center, we really want to build a relationship. So they're having interviews now. So, you know, they don't have to present. Well, they will if they get to be the finalist present, uh, but this, they're going to have interviews and then they'll have interviews with the, uh, the, the selection panel, but the architect will be there and someone from the design team. So then it becomes, they can hear what, you know, they, they'll say what their idea is or what their process or what they're thinking of, but then all the other feedback might just help them expand and think, oh, I could do, just like me thinking, I'll just do this mural and then, oh no, you know, the satellite's coming out. So just give them that idea, uh, that time 
and talking to people to e expand on their idea or get support for uh, different, if they want to, they can say, well, this is what I'd really like to do, but I don't know a fabricator. Well, we know the fabricators. And, but I think it's all about, that's what we said. We want to build a relationship. Now we have their names and hopefully, uh, you know, maybe we can purchase artwork in the future for other projects. So we really want to, that this isn't just one time thing at Topico Center, we're done. I think so. so getting back to everyone, just building these strong relationships. And there's actually two mentorships too. So two young uh, artists can mentor with uh, on these projects and they're going to get paid to mentor with them. So. <laughs> nice, good. <laughs> Yeah. Just to, sorry, uh, another quick uh, point. Um, when when someone is new to the process and they want to learn, it's 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 okay to be uncomfortable, and it's okay to to ask you know, questions. Elders or community members are typically very very patient, and of course they they want to help as well, and they want to you know potentially teach those as well. So it's okay to be uncomfortable, essentially. Yeah, I think um, the w number one thing that I've learned through working with people. Uh, indigenous people on projects is um, step one, who are you talking to? So who speaks for that territory? And that local voice is the voice you want to hear uh, first. Um, and so uh, like here, we're on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek territories and Mississauga of Skugok and Six Nations are the two closest communities, but there's also, uh, sorry, Mississauga of the Credit and um, and Six Nations are the two closest, and then Mississauga of Skugok is a little bit farther. Um, and all of those entities have a, um, a branch of their First Nation, if you go on their website, that has sort of like a, a consultations arm to their, their governance structure. So that could be a first relationship. But actually, the most fruitful relationship might be the one that already exists. So ask your client group, do, do you have a relationship or have you shared an initiative with an Indigenous entity before? Because really, the, per, the people who are most interested in the project will be the ones who have had some contact with that project already. So really, those voices are who you, who you invite, I think. Um, so that first step is really critical. And then once you have that first Indigenous voice, you can always ask, who else should be at this table? You know, who else should we invite to speak for this territory uh, in regards to this project? Um, so always ask at each stage, you know, and how would you like to, how would you like to interact with this project? Because sometimes they just only have time for a meeting or two, you know, and really can't you know, hold your hand throughout the whole project. So you might just get a limited amount of time. So it's really critical that those questions are good and meaningful. And those are always things that you can run by the participants you've identified, you know, uh, are these good questions to ask? Is there anything that I'm missing? Um, are they understandable? So really work with your participant group. Um, that first relationship is sometimes the hardest one to find. But then once you have that first voice, just start asking questions. Um, about the process itself. So um, thanks so much for your thoughts on that, Danny, Danny and Matthew, uh, Rebecca, because it's a really critical, critical question. Um, uh, this is more of a statement. Simon Co says, everybody needs a star blanket <laughs> in these times. <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, that's, that's probably true. <laughs> we have to wrap the good thoughts and warm feelings from our community around ourselves. <laughs> That is true. Um, so uh, Christopher Ferguson asks, at what point in the design process is it expected to account for allied arts to engage with the architecture? Oh, Rebecca's wandered off, so we'll save that for when she comes back. Um, Jason uh, asks, um, thinking back to Matthew's description of the differences between Western and Indigenous ways of thinking, can you speak to how processes for the procurement of public art or architecture do or do not engage with our support or active participation of Indigenous communities, artists, and ideas? I'm not sure if I quite understand that question. Matthew, do you, do you get that? I, I can pretend I do and answer it. <laughs> okay, good deal. <laughs> So, I mean, we're talking about two different things here. One is about architectural procurement and the other one is about uh, art, I would imagine. There's two kind of layers to this. Um, 
And as I mentioned just previously, like for us, we're, we're seeing a lot of processes like a P3 process that governments are going through, whether it's Infrastructure Ontario or whoever else, it really precludes any consultation until the design work is made. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we've seen, um, we've seen this occur and we've seen it shift, but really, um, and we've been part of the process for a P3 pursuit before, and it's really backwards from the way that we like to think about our process and how we engage uh, with people. As I as I said previously, it's about relationship building. It's really hard to implement any ideas of indigeneity into projects when the design is already done prior to speaking to anyone. It's almost like you're doing lip service at that point in time or just checking off a box. It makes it a little bit easier if you have an Indigenous consultant on board because we can implement ideas and, and words that we've heard previously. But again, for us, it's really about engaging with that specific community in order to pull out the ideas that are relevant to that specific community. So we're not huge fans of a P3 process. We think that it's, it's not, it doesn't build the best, um, the best work or the best process by which to get to good work with Indigenous people. And I don't think that Indigenous people are that much different than the rest of the world. So, you know, I don't think it's good for anyone really. Um, with regards to what we're seeing and what we're liking these days, it's more of an IPD process. So you're thinking about, you know, the values of a project right up front. You're bringing everyone to the table to discuss the work as it's being designed, as it's being built. And it's much more of an open process. Um, it takes a lot more time, um, but it's also going to get you to a better product. And you know, you don't have the you don't have the value engineering at the end. You're doing all that work up front to make sure that you can afford what you're doing, and that you're embedding the values that you think are important to that project deep within the entire project. Now, this kind of relates to procurement of arts, and I'm not going to be I'm not an expert on this by any means, but um, we see. We see thinking about these things or the value of, uh, of art as a part of the larger narrative for a project, whether it's about, you know, urban realm, if it's art that's for the public, if it's embedded into the interior of a building. Um, but it should be a part of the larger narrative. It should tie into the story of the building, uh, the, the Indigenous ideas that are embedded in that building so that they all start to tell a story. Uh, we talk about this a lot where indigeneity for us is not like throwing a throwing a, a medicine wheel on the wall that's easily identifiable and, and identifiable and saying, oh no, now it's indigenous. It's really about layering indigenous knowledge within to the architecture, the design, the art of the building, so that all those layers start to create a story that's much larger than one of these pieces involved. So we see these two as very, uh, very much integrated. And that procurement process, we believe, you know, should be led by uh, if it's for Indigenous work, it should be led by Indigenous curators. Um, so I mean, there's, there's for us, it's about, you know, engaging early. It's, it's about having conversations, about creating a narrative and creating a connection for larger uh, work uh, for relationship between architecture and art. Yeah, I don't know if I answered the question because I'm not sure. <laughs> it sure sounded like it to me. <laughs> Um, so Rebecca, there's one for you here. Um, uh, whereabouts in the process uh, should we involve allied arts uh, in the architectural process of design? And uh, how can we make that a deeper expression than just throwing a piece of art on the wall after the design's done and calling that a day? <laughs> so that's combining a few, a few questions there. No, I think it, um, Matthew answered it really well, that it uh, has to be right at the beginning. And, uh, and then, because the architecture uh, or the architects are designing how things will flow through buildings, you know, and so then you might need wayfinding, you know, like even on an elevator, there could be like a, a painting. So, you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm on number three because it's the water, you know, or something, but it has to be, yeah, it can't, uh, all of these, um, well, with two of them, with the, um, what do you call it, the um, Queen West Health Centre and CAMH, we were given the spaces. But uh, there was lots of meetings beforehand, you know, in terms of, and especially from the staff and the um, and staff who were actually former patients too, and what, how they felt to make the space. 
So those conversations were really good to have. And uh, so that's why I hope I answered that. So that made it, uh, yeah, all the more. And then it, it built relationships even with, uh, my goodness, the construction crews and things too. Like we had to, you know, make sure. And then it was COVID, which, uh, you know, made everything, the, the mural took longer because of this, the sky lifts or whatever, those sky jacks. We couldn't have three or four people on them, only one person. So it took a little longer, but it all got done. So I, I guess it went off topic a little bit, but yeah. Great. But it makes it a better process right from the beginning. It was mm -hmm. just conversations with everybody. Yeah, uh, there's another, I'm going to consolidate a few other questions um, here into uh, a one question for the panel. Um, so people are asking about uh, response to water rights, uh, response to climate uh, and environmental conservation in, in the Indigenous perspective, and, and how do we support those other life systems? Uh, so, um, so that was a, a question that's come up a couple of times. Uh, Specifically, how do we think that Indigenous voices can speak to the climate change crisis? So I'm going to pop this over to Danny first for a change, uh, and and then the rest of everyone can chime in. That's a, a great question. It's not a it's certainly not an easy one to to answer. Um, but You're welcome, Danny. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, interestingly enough, one of my thesis um, in my final semesters in my master's program was looking at that very question is um, we're, we're at the forefront or we're looking at this climate crisis um, ahead of us and how can we use Indigenous knowledge to help better inform architectural practices. So it's looking at sustainable building methods, um, utilizing local material. Uh, looking at passive um, um, and after passive um, ventilation um, techniques so that buildings aren't um, so much of a, an energy hog per se. So it's kind of a conundrum too when you think about indi uh, architecture and indigeneity um, when we think about protecting land and, and uh, water systems, you know, architectures, you know, it, it, it makes quite the impact when you break the ground into, into um, building something. So how, we always think about you know, ways to, to do it in a respectful way. So, you know, sustainable building practice, um, looking at mass timber as, um, as a way for construction. Um, when you compare it to other building uh, materials like concrete or, or others. So I'll, I'll start there and I'll let my other colleagues add to that. Yeah, um, chime in with your thoughts. Uh, I don't know, Rebecca or Matthew, if anything comes to mind on that front. I mean, I, I always say that we need to reframe the way that we're thinking about it. I mean, the earth will be fine. <laughs> we are the ones that are going to be in trouble as humans, you know, and we're, we're the ones that are creating the mess, but we, as I said earlier, are a blip in time the trees will go on the bacteria will go on the water will go on and it'll eventually correct itself but mother earth will take care of us you know and we'll get rid of us if we're not contributing in a way that is is kind to all the other relations that we have on this earth you know we have a relationship that we need to honor with that and the moment we start thinking about the one that we're the ones that are in danger i think is the moment that people will start acting in a manner that's more appropriate I mean, you can call that an indigenous way of thinking or you can just call it having respect for other things around us, you know, and taking us off the top of the pyramid. So for me, it's to just be a reframing of, you know, what's the question? Is it a climate crisis or is it a human crisis? I think it's a human crisis. I think we're the ones that are in trouble. Yeah, I'd 100% agree with that. <laughs> It's really in our own best interests. Um, I remember this beautiful story that uh, it was um, in a Tikamikshing, and I was speaking with um, uh, uh, a couple of, of uh, people there. Uh, one of them um, said that uh, what, the way we used to um, pick cranberries, they'd come back stronger the next year. And the way we used to fish, we used to put fish weirs, which helped us fish, but actually created breeding habitat for the fish because it created that those elements in the water that they liked to go and get busy under 
and um, and protected the eggs. And then, um, you know, what we did that day was we went out and we planted monomans. So we planted wild rice. And that's what we used to do is we sort of just nudging those natural systems so that they could support us. And I think we have to get back to that way of thinking that we're not detrimental inherently. We are, should be inherently, uh, you know, supporting the life systems around us. And we just have to change how we think about ourselves and how we, how, what our duties are to speak for our land. And, and yeah, what, you know, not mitigating impacts, but actually being regenerative. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, this is a good question for Rebecca. Um, and maybe the, the rest of us can chime in afterwards. Um, how does, um, uh, how does uh, Indigenous perspectives enhance mental health in the built environment, uh, specifically sort of looking at your work at, uh, at CMA, CAMH? Well, there's been so many articles because at one point, like I said, in 1996, the government didn't want to fund any artwork in a health center. But they've, they've realized, I think England has been very at the top of noticing, because you just have to imagine if you're going through a cancer treatment or something and all you're in is white walls. But if you can mm -hmm. see a beautiful painting or even um, even care, uh, I mean caretakers or uh, care, uh, what do you call those, um, the people that clean the buildings, they said that even makes a difference in their life when they're going around the building and they come around and there they see this painting or an artwork. So it's just enhancing everyone's experience while in the buildings on all levels, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, in as, as uh, panelists start talking, I'm gonna be typing in uh, books and resources that Sherry can then bunt out to the rest of the crew because there are books and resources that are good. The best resource though, and I think we'd all agree on this, is to talk to the local indigenous people who speak for the territory in which you're designing. So talking to people <laughs> is really, really number one in terms of how do you learn about indigenous design and how to integrate the indigenous perspectives into this. Um, uh, I'll do one final question, and I think this might be all that we have time for today. Um, so uh, Philip Ghosh has noticed that most of the projects we're talking about uh, that have successfully um, integrated Indigenous perspectives are institutional. So are there any thoughts on how we could incorporate Indigenous ways of thinking uh, in architecture in non-institutional projects? Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll pass that to Matthew first. Sure. I mean, you're talking about residential projects from even multi-use residential. And for us, I mean, there's a bunch of things that resonate that we can use or think about in a similar manner. One is about community. You know, how do you create community in multi-unit residential or even smaller? And I talked about that a little bit about multi-generational households, how we're housing um, our elders, but also our children and creating um, more dynamic uh, households that will allow you to maybe not live together, but live close together so that we can all take care of each other. The elders can teach the children, the children can take care of the elders, the parents can go to work. You know, there's a bunch of benefits that we have lost to the post-industrial revolution. Um, but yeah, for us, we know there's ideas that you can push forward about urban agriculture, uh, about community, about gathering, mm -hmm. about creating spaces uh, for multi-generational households in, in residential. And um, I'm just going to add to Aladia's comment, you know, it's not also about talking, it's also about listening to people and keeping your mouth closed sometimes and allowing them to talk. <laughs> Yeah, great point, Matthew, and I'm just going to add on to that, thinking about housing in, you know, for my area in northern Saskatchewan or northern Canada, how do we think about um, energy use in, in those particular cases? Uh, how do we create a spaces for the hot summers and the cold, cold winters? Um, thinking about um, specific ideas, listening to community members, uh, using local building materials, again, being very specific to the communities that you're working in will we'll go a, a long, long way. Yeah, I think everyone said, I don't have anything to add because I think it was all well said. Okay, thanks so much. Well, we're nearing the end of our time. Is there um, anything else that you just want, parting thoughts? Uh, I'll go around the room. Anything uh, that you'd like to share that you think is really critical for people to remember today? 
you know what? We're at the end of the time, so I don't think we're going to be able to do that. So you're just going to have to keep an eye on our work. That's all. <laughs> and we'll speak through our work. <laughs> I'm also going to try and oomph up my own website to have some of these common questions and see if I can answer a few of them. Like, for instance, those books and resources is a question that always comes up when we're talking. And yeah, there are a few actually now. Um, our Voices and Our Voices too is an all Canadian, well, by and for Indigenous people. It's a comp uh, compendium of, of different chapters of people's perspectives on architectural work and Indigenous um, Indigenous architecture. There's the Contemporary Handbook of Indigenous Architecture, and then there's a few local books local to this area that I've put in chat. So I hope Sherry can pass those on. Um, and yeah, um, I guess watch this space, folks. <laughs> so thanks so much to our, our panelists, Rebecca Baird, Matthew Hickey, and Danny Roy. And I think it's time to sign off. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your wonderful questions, everyone. As well.